with any electronic uh, devices and just keep them away from the microphone. Uh, if there's any interest to declare to do with today's business, now is the time to do so. If not, we'll move on. With apologies from Emma Rogan and uh, Gemma Dolan is joining us uh, through the Starleaf uh, facility and you're very welcome, uh, Gemma. I'll invite the clerk just to indicate if anybody has delegated their vote under the relevant standing order. Christine? Under standing order 1156, Emma Rogan has delegated her vote to the Deputy Chairperson, Linda Dillon. Okay, thank you, Christine. The draft minutes of the meeting that was held on the 16th of June um, are available uh, pages 5 to 9 of your meeting pack, and if members are content that they're a true reflection of the meeting, then I will uh, sign them accordingly, unless there's any amendments members need to make. Not agreed. Okay. Agreed. Matters arising. Um, item 1 is just the Committee Forward Work Programme, pages 11 to 15. The oral evidence sessions on the bill for Thursday have all been confirmed and a further written information uh, to be provided by the Department on its financial position and COVID-19 exercise commissioned by the Department of Finance uh, will now be scheduled for next week. Um, so it's there for members to note in terms of the updated forward uh, work programme. Uh, item two is a letter from the Minister in respect of the mental health provisions of the Coronavirus Act 2020, um, pages three and four of the table pack. The Minister has written to advise that the mental health provisions, which provided for reductions in the number of medical reports required by the Court before healthcare disposals could be made, and by the Department before prisoners could be transferred to psychiatric hospitals, and that the increased time scale for admitting people to hospital are no longer needed. The Department of Health is therefore intending to switch them off and if the situation changes and pressures on the trust start to increase again, the provisions can be uh, reactivated. So it's there for members to note uh, by way of an update. Um, item three is a response from the uh, OFM DFM in respect of the Westminster Acts that contain provisions on devolved matters that are yet to be commenced, pages five to eight of the table pack. Uh, at our meeting, members will recall on the 28th of May, now, considering proposals to commence these devolved provisions of the Criminal Finance Act and the Crime Act, the committee did write then to FMDFM in respect of a mechanism that could be put in place to establish the views of and indeed consent from the Assembly in respect of commencement provisions and acts that related to devolved matters. If legislation had not already completed this passage through Westminster, an LCM would be required. Uh, but the committee also asked if there are any other similar acts um, across other departments. FMDFM have responded, outlined that this position has not arisen before and, uh, it is, uh, and that there is one other act um, that has been passed during 2017-20 to 20 when the Assembly wasn't operating in which some default provisions remain to be commenced. Uh, the Act falls within the responsibilities of the Department of Finance. FMDFM have indicated, uh, given the very limited number of cases, that the unique circumstances in which these have arisen and such circumstances are un unlikely to arise again. They believe the approach adopted by the Justice Minister being proportionate, transparent and striking the appropriate balance between the normal ministerial authority to commence provisions and the courtesy of consulting the Assembly in view of the absence of its involvement in the earlier stages of the legislative process. So members just advise FMDFM do not therefore consider a more specific mechanism is required, but highlight that it would be appropriate for the Assembly to consider the need for such a mechanism on its own initiative if it wished to do so, and in those circumstances their officials would be happy to engage with the Assembly uh, officials to consider these issues further. So members, given the limited number of cases in which this has arisen, um, suggesting that we would note uh, the response uh, in terms of FMDFM and that, that we would write to the Committee on Procedures as the relevant committee highlighting this issue and asking as to whether it considers this matter uh, needs to be taken forward to provide a mechanism uh, for the Assembly in respect of commencement provisions, provisions in acts that relate to involved matters where legislation had not already completed the passage through Westminster that normally would require the CM. So if members are content, we'll... Uh, note this response and we'll write to the committee uh, for procedures and we'll also write to the committee for finance highlighting this case uh, given that it is the uh, likely to arise in respect of the Department of Finance as outlined in the FMDFM correspondence. Chair, sure. are we asking procedures to do something in relation to it or are we leaving it to their discretion? It would, it would be to leave to their discretion as to what they would do would be the normal process. You know, we're highlighting this was an issue that we've discussed, considered, and it's something that we want to draw to their attention, and it's a matter then for, for those members as to what to do. Okay. 
Um, item 4, counter-terrorism bill. At our meeting on the 14th of May, we considered further information from the Department in respect of counter-terrorism uh, bill and the proposed approach by the UK Government to apply retrospectively provisions in a previous bill to remove the automatic right to early release within Northern Ireland. Uh, to assist its consideration of the issue, the Committee agreed to request a copy of the Lord Chancellor and the Secretary of State for Justice's letter dated the 24th of April, setting out the background to and rationale uh, behind the Government's change of approach. The Minister for Justice has written, providing an update uh, on recent developments, a copy of the 24th of April letter. Uh, and other relevant correspondence. The Minister highlights that the UK Government has sovereignty over this area, given legislation surrounding terrorist defences is a reserved matter, but an LCM is likely to be required for some provisions. The Minister has also outlined that she does not consider that there is an operational imperative to retrospectively apply the removal of the automatic right to early release of terrorist offenders currently in custody in Northern Ireland and that she has a number of concerns and reservations in this regard, including the potential to undermine key public protection measures associated with the current sentencing and release arrangements in Northern Ireland. She has also advised the UK Government that at this stage she would not be able to support the introduction of an LCM into the Assembly, given her reservations, and has highlighted the distinct possibility that an LCM would not garner necessary support to progress within the Executive and or through the Assembly. Uh, the Minister has indicated that engagement continues between officials on the issues and that she will update the Committee on any further significant uh, developments. Uh, so, Members, it is there for our consideration in terms of noting the current position and whether any further information or clarification uh, or indeed views uh, which uh, members of the Committee want to uh, express in respect of this. Mr Free. Yes, thank you, Chair. I am um, extremely worried about this. Um, if the ultimate goal is that this is to ensure equal treatment of terrorist offenders across all the jurisdictions of the UK, and the Minister has already given her uh, support to that concept, I, I really worry about her thought process on this, and I would like to find out more information about it. She cites a number of reasons why she won't bring an LCM. It seems to be the main one is that she doesn't think that she can garner support in the House. Now, I don't know how she's testing that, I don't know how she's measuring that, but that in itself shouldn't be a reason why you wouldn't bring an LCM to the House and let democracy play out. Uh, so that's the first thing. The, the other things I would worry about is the detail of, of why she cites that she, she's worried and concerned about some aspects of the bill. Uh, one of them being how it would affect our licence procedures. Now. It seems to me the information that I have at hand, which we, we all have seen, is that basically one of these clauses will mean that terrorist offenders who, who commit the most heinous of crimes will have to serve longer in custody. Uh, now, people get out and go on licence, and they're monitored and everything else in some cases. Uh, Still, if these people are deemed still to be dangerous, the best place for them is still in prison, if they have been uh, given that sentence. So I would like to know how and why it interferes and affects the licence requirements that we have in Northern Ireland. And it seems to be in the bill proposed that whilst even these people will serve greater, longer sentences, there are automatic periods of licence on top of that. So I don't see yet how it will do damage and violence to our licence requirements and procedures. And I, would like to, I would like the Minister to outline the detail of that. Also, she cites the reason about uh, young offenders. And whilst I agree with her with regards to coercive control of terrorist organisations for young people, I, still, I, I think reading this that it, it's, it's for people who commit the most serious of crimes that basically get a life sentence, if I'm, if I'm right. Now, I would, I would want to know that I can't imagine so many young people around the age of 10, whilst they will most certainly be involved in rioting and, and activities such like that, coerced into that or encouraged into that, 
I, I don't know that they would be used by terrorist organisations to commit the most serious of crimes, i.e. murder. So I would like to have more information on that. Uh, the Minister talks about uh, security uh, detail. Uh, I can't just remember where I got it from. Uh, but she cites, she cites about uh, security detail that her department has produced. I would like to see that detail, if at all possible. Uh, just, to, just to be armed and have the, have the same sight as the Minister and the Department who have made these decisions. Uh, I can't just remember, I can't, where, I can't find it, I can't locate it, Chair, but it's somewhere where the Minister talks about uh, security assessments being used uh, to inform judgment. And I would like to see those security assessments, um, to see the evidence for which she has made her decision. Uh, I think it would be very serious if this House, if the House does not get to debate these issues and that we don't ultimately get to a point where all the jurisdictions of the UK have got similar legislation to deal with the most uh, violent criminals and terrorists that are within our society and our people need to protect it. And not bringing forward an LCM will not bring that protection to our people. And I think we need an explanation. I'll leave it there, Chair. Thank you, Paul. Linda? A, a couple of issues. First of all, the assumption that this is going to make us any safer is ridiculous. And I think if we're going to ask for all of that information to support why we're not doing it, I would like the information as to why it was implemented anywhere, because to me it looks like, and, and I've raised this before whenever we've talked about it before, it was a gut reaction, and let's let's be seen to be hard on terrorists. Let's be seen to be, you know, the, the hardliners in relation to taking a hard line against these terrorist actions. If there's some evidence to support that, it will actually make a real difference, because in relation to any issue, and we've talked about this at length, both in this committee and in the chamber, around the rehabilitation and and that actually being the important element of working with any prisoner. It is about rehabilitating. We're not keeping prisoners in jail, or large numbers of prisoners at least, in jail for all of their lives. So we need to rehabilitate them. These people are coming back out onto our streets, and we need to ensure that they're coming back out with a, a different, I suppose, outlook, and in a manner in which they are, as has already been outlined here, no longer a danger to society. So keeping them in jail longer is not going to rehabilitate them. So I actually think we need to look at where is the evidence that this is actually going to have any real impact. I think there are possibly human rights issues in relation to it. I would like that scoped out as well. And when Paul speaks about the equality and having the, the, the same treatment right across, I think if it's, if it's bad law, if it's the wrong law, we shouldn't be arguing that we should have bad law just because other parts of these islands have bad law. We should be asking, why are they not looking at putting better law in place that we can then follow, knowing that there is actual real positive outcomes for everybody, that's for society at large and for the individuals who, for whatever reason, have taken that path. So I, th I just think that we can't take the attitude that this definitely is a good thing, it's what's going to make people safer without questioning that. Apart from anything else, I think the Minister is right to do have reservations in relation to this and I think Paul's actually fair enough in asking the questions as to why this is the position she's taken because it would be good for us to have those answers but I, I think we need much more in terms of detail as to what the evidence is that this will actually have any positive impact in relation to our society and for me that's I suppose the, the real issues and, and I also would like just to, to scope out the human rights what the views would be in relation to how it would be in line with human rights law. Okay, thanks, Rachel Williams. Yeah, sorry, um, Chair Linda's um, taken a number of my points there. I um, certainly agree that we do need more information, um, be it maybe from different perspectives. But in terms of the uh, human rights legislation, um, the Minister quotes Article 7 and that this would likely be challenged in the courts and I would like a wee bit more information on how that decision has been arrived to and if there is any um, any details from, perhaps from the Human Rights Commission or from an incoming Attorney General 
uh, perhaps on on the legal status of that. That would be very helpful. Thank you, um, Doug Brady. Sure, thank you. Uh, I've got to say, I mean, everybody's raised some really, really good points here, and has made good points. And and, and as of Paul and, and and Rachel, I think that they are all good points. I think what they absolutely highlight is we need some more information here, um, be, because there are differing views, and the, the rationale for. For, for not having an LCM or the rationale for ha going for an LCM, we, we need to know that in, in, in more in more depth. Because for me, it's about future proofing our laws. What is the landscape going to be in five years time or 10 years time or 20 years time, especially when we move outside of the EU? And I think we sometimes get a little <coughs> stuck by domestic terrorism. Whereas actually I see this as something future proofing against international terrorism. Because as it stands now, in the, in, in, and if you look at this through primary colours, um, if we have a major rise in international terrorism again, and the trend is going that way, if we have a United Kingdom where Northern Ireland has a softer um, way of dealing with, with international terrorism, as, in, uh, as we're going to have here, then those people who wish to attack the United Kingdom will do, through, will do it through Northern Ireland, that we will become the soft belly of the United Kingdom for international terrorists. So I, I, I would like to see more information in regards to that rationale um, uh, because it's important that, that we understand it and, and we make the right decisions around this. I'm not convinced either way, just at this moment in time, Chair. Okay. Okay, members. Just, just one point of information, Chair. That, that's, uh, I said at the... Uh, Security assessment on page 27 of our PAC's second paragraph that reads, I understand my and this is Neil Mealong, the Minister, I understand my officials recently provided their counterparts in your, your department with a detailed assessment of the operational security implications for Northern Ireland were the bill to be introduced in its current form. So would like to, I would like to see that information if possible. Okay. Well, listen, I'm happy that we pulled together a, a letter from the committee asking for all of that information. I, I think it at some point, we may need to have the Minister come to the committee. Um, my, my understanding at the start of this was the Minister was supportive um, and, and said as such, and now is indicating something different. So uh, I think questions members have, have asked may be pertinent to, to that decision-making process that's currently going on within the Minister's department. Um, but if we pull together uh, what members have, have raised, we'll write back to the, to the uh, Minister about this. Um, to try and get some more information, and then I suspect we're going to need to find out from the minister what her position is on this. Um, ultimately, she's the justice minister and needs to stand over whatever decision um, that she takes. Uh, and ultimately, then if there's an LCM comes forward, it's up to the MLAs to then stand over what they do subsequent to that. But at this stage, the ball is very much in the minister's court, and we need to get more information. And I'm happy that the committee would seek that. We agreed then to, to agreed. do that. Agreed. Item 5, um, Domestic Abuse Family Proceedings Bill, pages 49 to 69 of your meeting pack. At our meeting on the 23rd of April, the committee agreed to refer the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill to the Examiner of Statutory Rules and request a report highlighting any delegated powers to which she wished to draw attention. In particular, the committee requested views on whether it is appropriate for each of the powers to be left to subordinate legislation rather than including them in the bill itself and whether the choice of assembly procedure for each is the most appropriate. The examiner for statutory rules has provided her report to the committee and ind indicates that she is satisfied that the rulemaking powers presently provided for in the bill are appropriate and each is subject to an appropriate level of scrutiny by the assembly. So members, it's there to note the advice of the examiner of statutory rules on delegated powers within the domestic abuse and family proceedings bill. Unless any further clarity is required, we will duly note it. Noted. And right. six. Again, on the Domestic Abuse Family Proceedings Bill, update on the housing issues and paid special leave for victims of domestic abuse, pages 71 to 78 of your meeting pack. The Minister has written providing an update in relation to housing issues and the paid special leave for victims of domestic abuse. Uh, the Minister for Communities has indicated that she does not believe there is a need to replicate the provisions to grant secure tenancy for victims of domestic abuse in Northern Ireland, given the clear differences between current structures here compared to England. Uh, she has also highlighted the provision of temporary accommodation available to male victims of domestic abuse, confirmed that the Supporting People programme does not currently grant fund any services for men at risk of domestic abuse. 
outlined that research conducted in November 2018 concluded that the numbers of men presenting as victims of domestic abuse did not immediately suggest a demand for refuge accommodation and provided an update in relation to the allocation of housing points. Uh, the Justice Minister also wrote to the Minister for the Economy for her views on paid special leave um, and she has asked her officials to consider this alongside a range of other employment related issues as part of a longer term vision for employment relations in Northern Ireland. The Economy Minister uh, has also, um, also agrees with the Justice Minister that the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill is not the right legislative vehicle for this provision and if there is consensus that legislative provision is required that she will identify a suitable vehicle at that time. Um, the Justice Minister has also highlighted that her officials, together with officials in the Department for the Economy, uh, the Department uh, of Health and the Department for Communities, have agreed to take part in a review of support in the workspace for survivors of domestic abuse, which was launched by the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy on the 9th of June, and will examine the availability of flexible working, unplanned leave and other employment needs to identify how employers and government could provide better support at work. So, members, it's there for your consideration on the responses that have been provided and whether any further uh, information or clarification uh, should be sought at this stage uh, or if members are content to discuss the issues further in due course in the context of the domestic abuse bill at the relevant stages. I'm happy to... Okay. okay. Item 7. At our meeting on the 23rd of April, the committee considered further information provided by the Department of Justice in relation to a proposal for a statutory rule updating the list of police stations across Northern Ireland where convicted sex offenders can attend to notify the police of their personal details and agreed that it was content with the proposal for the statutory rule. Further information was also requested in relation to the removal of three police stations from the list and this was subsequently provided by the department and noted by members. The statutory rule has now been laid by the department um, on the 3rd of June and it's subject to the negative resolution procedure. There have been no changes to the policy content since the committee considered the SL1. Uh, so members, I need to put the formal question if members are content um, subject to the findings of the examiner of statutory rules on the technical aspects of the rule. I put the question formally to members um, that the Committee for Justice considered SR 2020 forward slash 93, the Sexual Offences Act 2003 prescribed police stations, regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. Item 8. Um, Human Rights Guidance for the Police and Public Prosecution Service. At our meeting on the 19th of June, the committee agreed that it was content <coughs> with the Attorney General's Human Rights Guidance for the PPS and the PSNI to assist consideration of investigations into or prosecutions for the offence of failing to report a serious sexual offence under Section 5 of the Criminal Law Act, Northern Ireland 1967. The Attorney General has now provided information on a proposed statutory rule. It's subject to negative resolution procedure and to, it brings the guidance into operation on the 29th of June uh, 2020. So members, it's to seek your views if you're content with the proposed statutory rule uh, or whether any further information is required. Members content? Content. Okay, Great. Thank you. Item um, 9. The department's proposing to carry out a six-week targeted stakeholder consultation on a package of biometric provisions which are being considered for inclusion within the Justice Miscellaneous Provisions Bill, subject to meeting the bill timelines. The proposals will amend Schedule 2 of the Criminal Justice Act 2013 that makes uh, statutory provision for a new framework for the retention and destruction of DNA and fingerprints taken from persons in connection with the investigation of an offence under the Police and Criminal Evidence Order 1989. Uh, to date, the Department has not been able to bring these provisions into operation and now it needs to amend the elements of the provisions that allow for the indefinite retention of material relating to convicted persons following a successful challenge against the United Kingdom in the European Court of Human Rights. The Department therefore intends to undertake a targeted consultation on proposals to change these elements to make sure that Schedule 2 of the Act is fit for purpose when the time comes for it to be brought into operation. A copy of the draft consultation document setting out the proposed changes is in the meeting pack. The Department intends to issue 
the consultation on the 30th of June with the closing date of the 10th of August and will make every effort to ensure that the consultation document is brought to the attention of those that have an interest in the policy proposals. The Department will update the Committee following analysis of the responses. Um, so, members, it's to seek your views on whether you're content to note this plan targeted consultation and consider the matter further when the Department provides the results of the consultation, the proposed way forward, uh, or whether any views need to be expressed at this stage. Um, there are two issues, members, that I'm going to flag up that you may wish to raise. One's the short length of the proposed consultation period over summer months. Uh, the Committee may wish to recommend a longer period until the end of August and why the Department is not undertaking a public consultation um, and what stakeholders or organisations the Department is including in this targeted consultation and how it intends to ensure that the consultation is brought to the attention of those who are likely to have an interest in these policy proposals. I would agree with you, Chair, with regards to the public consultation. I don't, I don't understand why they would uh, restrict themselves to a target. Uh, some of this is you know, a bit fundamental freedom stuff. I'm not saying that I'm opposed to it, absolutely not, because ultimately it could keep people safe. Uh, but I do note the years there. They talk about 25 years and up to 75 years for more serious offences. Um, it's funny that they can retain DNA for that length of time, but they can't keep emails for more than three months. <laughs> Your point's made. I'll leave for others to say whether it's well or not. Um, I'm happy that we we raised the issue about the short consultation period and the targeted nature. Um, it was strange when I read it about you know making sure that we'll get this to the people that have an interest. You know, what does that mean? Doug Beatty? Yeah, Chair, I, th I think you're right. And I think the short consultation is actually directly linked to the fact that it's targeted. If it wasn't targeted, they would have to do a longer consultation because it was public. So I think that's why the two are by the way they are. So if they change one, they would automatically be changing the other, I think. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'd like to agree with that, Doug, but I think there has been a creep in that practice. The 12-week period has repeatedly been shortened time and time again, so I think it would do no harm to signal that we would like to see it reformed at every opportunity. Yeah, well, if you're happy, we'll, we'll write suggesting that um, it should be a normal consultation um, and it should be a public consultation, um, and that would be the way the committee would wish as a matter of principle, unless there is a an overriding rationale for it to be targeted um, because of a particular time pressure. This indicates um, it's about being prepared as to when they plan to put it into operation, but they haven't put it into operation for years. And now there's been a, 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 Emergency. There's been a court finding around it. And again, it's not on the basis of here's the deadline, we're going to implement it on this date. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, this is why we need this short targeted period. The implementation of this is still open-ended with a no commitment around a specific date. So I'm not against short targeted consultations for exceptional circumstances. I don't see it on this. So um, if members are happy, we'll, we'll raise it in that context with the department, um, that that would be our view, unless they can provide an exceptionality to justify the approach that they're, they're recommending. Are members content then we do that? Agreed. Item 10 is correspondence. There's two items, um, copy, of a response from the Department of Justice to the Committee for Education providing information it had requested regarding disability discrimination applications to the Special Education Needs and Disability Tribunal and the guidance that's available. It's there for members to note. And uh, the second item is correspondence from the Committee for Health providing a copy of a joint uh, CAJ and Amnesty International briefing uh, paper raising concerns about the application of the enforcement of the health protection regulations at an anti-racist protests on the 6th of June and outlining a range of issues discussed by the committee, including consistency in the enforcement of the regulations for which the PSNI has responsibility and whether fines should be uh, waived. So, members, it's there uh, in terms of replying to the health committee advising uh, that when it comes to the operational practice um, of the policing uh, of these events, it's for the policing board and to hold to responsibility uh, the police in respect of that and uh, will respond in kind to the health committee. I have no problem on the regulations as to whether confidence or not has been undermined as a result of those practices. Um, I, have, I have some sympathy for the protesters um, in respect of the case that they're making, um, but as to why the police decided 
to do what they did and how they go about it, that's a matter for the policing board. If it comes into play on the regulations and confidence in, in them, uh, that's why I tabled the urgent oral. Um, it was in that context. Rachel? Yep, thanks, Chair. Um, likewise, I have um, sympathy here, especially with what had not happened the following week in, in Belfast. Um, I wonder just, it's, I'm just trying to find here and load up the uh, forward work programme. We're not due to get any representation from the PSNI until September, is it? Or is there any chance of, um, is that is that going to be factored into the forward work programme maybe to um, have a chat with the PSNI um, just on regulations as we had been doing throughout COVID? It might be an opportunity for this members of this committee to ask some questions. And I know that um, I've certainly been lobbied and then she raised um, with ourselves, I'm sure other members as well, on, on, the, um, on the policing approach. I do, I do think we need to get um, a date scheduled in for when we have the Chief Constable and a senior team here um, for the, the normal process. And, and in that, then these issues can be raised. So I'm happy that we take forward um, to schedule a meeting in um, with the Chief Constable and his team. It would have happened um, by now, in terms of the last time that we had it. Um, we focused on the COVID-19 in terms of the PSNI, but I think you're right, Rachel, to raise the, the broader point again about having the police in, and that's an opportunity where we can raise broader questions that are in the public interest. So um, we, we will schedule that to take place. Linda? I'll raise it again. I think that we need to be very careful we're not overlapping on what the police and board are already doing, because but it's, it's just doing the same thing twice and there's a public policing board meeting which the public have have access to that can view it streamed online and if we're going to ask the same questions that are being asked at the policing board i suppose one of the things is that that's a waste of everybody's valuable time you know we we do not have time as a committee to, to be doing somebody else's job and i'm quite sure that the chief constable and his senior team don't have time to do the same thing with us as they're doing with the policing board most of us have representation in relation to on the policing board, but I, I understand and I accept where Rachel is coming from in that that her party doesn't. But the chief constable in fairness and his senior team are always very open to doing specific meetings with elected representatives. I've never asked for a meeting and not been able to get it. So I think that might be another opportunity in relation to if there are specific issues around operational matters, this is not the place to be asking them about operational matters. I'm not saying we shouldn't have the PSNI, they're, they're part of the Justice family and it's fine to have them in here on an issue that is relevant to the committee, but not that is relevant to the policing board because we're, we're just duplicating somebody else's role. Well, I, I, I definitely don't want to duplicate the role of the policing board and I don't think the committee, to be fair to it, did whenever they came before us um, at the first meeting. Um, but I do think this committee would... The committee has a responsibility to carry out its scrutiny, accountability role, and, and not leave all of that to the policing board. The policing board looks after operational scrutiny, but it's this department that gives over £700 million to the PSNI. It's this assembly that passed the regulations. The policing board do not pass the law that the police then have to enforce. It's us. It's not any policing board member, unless they're an MLA. So I, I do see an interface uh, and scope for us to be able to question the police whenever it comes to how it places parades, how it manages protests, because if there's damage in public confidence as a result of laws that we have passed, we're not going to ask the policing board to change the law, we're going to ask this assembly to do it. So I think it's in that context that I would be an advocate that they do come up to this committee. It's not done on a regular basis. Um, I would like it to, to be done three times a year, four times a year, no more than that. Um, and we start looking at the broad principles and, and laws that they have to operate within. Um, that would be the way in which I think the committee would look at the, the policing aspect of this, not an everyday policing operational matters, my own, my own view on it. Okay, well then I'm happy that we, we schedule a meeting um, with the Chief Constable and his team and that we, we get that organised um, and I hope that to be done sooner rather than later, but bearing in mind the recess and so on that will be coming up. I have no chairman's business, um, bar I hope to take place in a, a Zoom with the House of Lords European Union Committee on terms of protocol, the protocol issues um, on the 30th of June. Any other business?
Then our next meeting will be this Thursday at 10.30 a.m. and will be in room 30. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.